St. Gobain for sponsoring the CPD validation of this webinar. Besides this nice little video, which I think is very appropriate for this webinar topic, I also just want to highlight some of the really great things they're doing in South Africa. And one thing is the gypsum recycling. And as a sustainability practitioner, we know how difficult it is to recycle gypsum when you're doing a refurb of a, of a building. And uh, San Gobain has come up with a solution that turns drywalling into fertilizer in the agriculture industry. And we really hope that this is going to scale up and that the processing facilities can also start processing some of the post-consumer waste. They're also one of the leaders in the industry regarding to EPDs and LCAs for their products. And I think that's very commendable in, in, in South Africa. And they also have a very successful global multi-comfort multi student competition where students are exposed to designing buildings with sustainability principles in mind. And I've been part of them uh, a couple of times. Four universities are currently participating in the global competition. And we're proud to say that South Africa has been consistently in the top 10 and got first prize in 2018. So I really hope that the, the collaboration with St. Gobain is continuing going forward. And to give you a little bit of background on the ILFI, the International Living Future Institute, their vision is to building a world that's socially just, culturally rich and ecologically restorative. To implement its mission, the ILFI operates a number of programs which really take an ecosystems approach to the built environment. And some of these programs include uh, the Living Building Challenge, which our previous webinar was about, the Living Community Challenge, Living Product Challenge, a Zero Carbon and, and Core Certification. And they also have a number of transparency labels. But in a different webinar, we'll talk about that in more detail. But just a, a little bit about the network, the Living Future Network, um, as this collaborative is part of that network, Globally, the ILFI has, a, has an ambassador network that spans around the globe and every continent and every country has their own uh, collaborative and some of them have even more collaboratives. And in South Africa, Tulani and I are the two ambassadors and also facilitators of the collaboratives. But we invite you to become part of the collaborative if you want to be part of this movement in South Africa. Very quickly, there is a Living Future accreditation, uh, which um, sort of acknowledges your knowledge around the Living Building Challenge and other programs of the International Living Future Institute. And in the last three months, two of our South African colleagues have achieved this accreditation, which is Michelle Ludwig and Audrey Puri. And I really want to congratulate them with uh, making the LFA accreditation. If you want to know more about the LFA, there's a link here which we'll provide and give to you after the webinar in, in a PDF form. We have some great speakers today from all over the world, and I'm going to introduce them briefly. So first up is Boris, calling in from San Francisco, who is Sustainability Manager at Stock. And I saw his presentation for the first time last year at the Isle of I conference, and I really wanted to bring it to South Africa, so I'm happy that that became a reality. Boris specializes in developing strategies for decarbonization of the built environment and has developed processes to deploy carbon reduction strategies at, at various scales. I'm really happy he's going to share some of that knowledge with us today. And just like me, he's a travel junkie, traveled 11 countries, European countries in two months and cannot wait until we are able to travel safely again, even though he probably have to readjust his decarbonization calls a little bit. Then, second up, we have uh, Oliver, an environmental practitioner at Green Cape, uh, working on the WISP program, and he'll probably talk to you about that more. He focuses on finding alternative applications for industrial waste streams that were destined for landfill, with a specific focus on construction materials. And Oliver also likes to travel, but he's still in the process of training his dog to sit on the back of his motorbike so he can come along on his road trips. And thirdly, we have Aditi, who is doing business development at OneClick LCA, which is one of the embodied energy calculators. 
She focuses on guiding clients on building LCAs and EPDs and providing tools for clients that allows them to make informed decisions and act on their sustainability strategies. Aditi uses her love for cooking and cooks a dish every weekend from different countries around the world to substitute her traveling diet. And I'm gonna hand over to Boris Same to thing. give us an overview of True Zero Carbon. Thanks everybody, super excited to be here. As Marlo's mentioned, my name is Boris, uh, last name's pronounced, pronounced Gamzechikov, uh, it's a long one. I'm usually the only Boris around, so that's, that's sufficient. Uh, I lead the carbon services at Stoke. We have offices in San Francisco, uh, Denver, and San Diego, but we work on projects globally. And we focus on sustainable real estate, but also work on the municipal, the corporate scale, and various sustainability and carbon reduction strategies. So I'll be covering an introduction to embodied carbon and really specific actionable strategies to start addressing embodied carbon today. So just setting the stage, the building sector globally is responsible for about 39% of greenhouse gas emissions. And looking at projection, projections currently, the global building stock uh, is expected to double in area by 2060. So in other words, over the next 35 years, 2 trillion square feet of new and rebuilt buildings will be constructed in cities worldwide. To put that in a different, uh, in a different way, that's essentially an entire New York City, all five boroughs, being constructed every 35 days for 35 years. So there's, there's a lot of, of potential carbon that's, that's going to be emitted here. Um, and as you all know, you know, mitigation strategies will need to be applied for us to, to live in the world we've become accustomed to living in. Taking a closer look at that 39%, these are the various life cycle stages uh, where the building sector emits carbon. Breaking that down a bit further, 28% of that 39% is operational carbon, while 11% is embodied carbon. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. So embodied carbon is related to the carbon emissions that come out of these life cycle stages. So everything from the material extraction, manufacturing, production, the actual construction of the materials, maintenance, reuse, and then any end of life uh, impacts landfilling, recycling even. So taking the lens off the globe and now looking at a single building, a single example building, we have uh, the relative carbon emissions here on the Y axis. Uh, and it, as you can see, embodied carbon emissions are mostly emitted before the building is constructed as they're related to the materials that go into the building. And with conventional operations here, you can see a slow, gradual increase in operational carbon. So this is related to the, the energy use, you know, the, the electricity, any fossil fuels that are used to, to power the building. So gradually, as the years go on, as the building is being used, uh, those emissions will gradually increase. So as, as Marlos mentioned, there's been a lot of focus over the past decade or so on increasing uh, building performance. And so this curve has really started shifting downward with efficient operations. And especially you know, in places like California, net zero energy is, is very much possible and is really taking off. So now it's looking like that curve uh, for operational carbon has, has been totally shifted down. Another interesting development is as the electric grids that the buildings are connected to increase in renewable energy, these curves will be pushed even further down. So as you saw those curves push down, the, the thing that did not really change is the embodied carbon piece of this story. And so what else is kind of interesting is, you know, we're looking at a 50 year lifespan here, but all the scientists are telling us uh, we have more like 20 years to make significant reductions. And when you look at 20 years, even with that conventional operation, uh, you can see that embodied carbon is a much bigger part of the story than we have we've maybe been, been considering. 
Uh, and studies have shown that for all new construction um, from now till 2050, the emissions will be split about half and half between embodied and operational. Uh, and as you saw, that's a new New York City every 35 days. There's also the concept of the time value of carbon um, that, that says the earlier carbon is emitted into the atmosphere, the more damaging it is because it is there longer. It does not go away for a long time and it has those damaging cumulative effects. And embodied carbon is emitted earlier on in the building life. And so, you know, one, one ton of carbon emitted 10 years ago is worse than one ton of carbon emitted in 10 years because of the cumulative um, damaging effects in the atmosphere. So looking again uh, a little more deeply at those life cycle stages that I had mentioned. So starting with the extraction and upstream production, transportation to the factory and manufacturing. So these three life cycle stages are known as cradle to gate. So that's essentially the cradle of all the materials, the original source of all the raw materials to the gate of the factory. And EPDs or environmental product declarations are essentially nutrition labels for materials uh, that state their various environmental impacts, including uh, embodied carbon emissions. And so manufacturers are typically the ones that are able to put together these EPDs. And because everything until the factory gate is within their purview, that's typically where EPDs draw their boundaries. So next, there's transport to the actual site, you know, from the factory shipped across the world, potentially to your building site, construction impacts, uh, and that's known as cradle to site. And then finally, any replacement, if you're looking through the building's life, any replacement throughout the building's life, you want to take into account. Uh, and then end of life, uh, any kind of disposal, incineration, landfilling, um, recycling that's done there, you want to include the impacts if you're considering cradle to grave. And the tool we use to quantify carbon of a building is known as a whole building life cycle assessment or LCA. These are typically done from a cradle to grave perspective, to include all these life cycle stages to really get a holistic understanding of the carbon story and to help drive uh, reductions. And so not all of these life cycle stages are created equal in terms of carbon. This is a generalization, but you know, roughly we've seen the cradle to gate portion take up almost 90% of the embodied carbon. And when you think about it, this kind of makes sense. You know, all in the factory and the extraction, all the energy that's being used, a lot of time fossil fuel based. Something that's that may be a bit counterintuitive is that transport to site is relatively low. There has been a you know a lot of focus on supporting local products through you know some of the green building certification programs. And while that is important for you know for a number of other reasons, um, social and uh, economic reasons. From a carbon perspective, if you're able to get something further away that's manufactured on a clean grid, that's usually better than getting something close by that's manufactured with a lot of fossil fuels. So it's really, this just shows that it's important to actually look at the numbers rather than just assuming one way or another. So now that we know embodied carbon's important, what should we do about it? So there's this organization, the Architecture 2030, uh, and they really look at the science behind, um, you know, the same science that underlies the Paris, ag Paris Agreement, having to go well below two degrees Celsius and closer to one and a half degrees Celsius of warming, and what that really means for the industry. What do we have to do? So they put out this challenge for embodied carbon, uh, and this is not just for buildings, it's also for infrastructure and then the materials that underlie um, buildings and infrastructure. Uh, and they, they say that we're, we need to shoot for a 40% reduction today, 45% in 2025, 65% in 2030, and then hit zero embodied carbon emissions in 2040. So, you know, to, to align with the global carbon redu reductions needed, we need to start making drastic changes today. So how do we go about doing this? 
So this is a description of kind of that whole building LCA process. And there's a lot of different ways to approach this, various tools, but this is uh, kind of a rough generalization. So one of the most time consuming parts of the whole process is understanding the quantity of materials in your building. Uh, and, and so, you know, we use a variety of sources to do that from Revit or other BIM models to building materials cost estimates to just doing takeoff of, of drawings. And usually it's a combination of all. So the goal here is to really understand what goes into our buildings, the quantity and the, pro the specific products. And this is sometimes not extremely obvious. Um, and once we have that, we use a variety of whole building LCA uh, softwares. Uh, One click LCA that you'll be hearing about later on, um, Tally and Athena Institute. Uh, and I'll go, go over a few free tools that you can use right away to start doing these types of assessments later on. Um, so what we do with this whole building LCA software is based on the materials that are used in the building, we load those quantities in, and then we find environmental impact data that is suitable to model those materials. And so, you know, the, the gold standard is the product specific EPD that is directly describing, it's, it's created by the manufacturer that makes your product, it's directly describing your material. And that's excellent when that's available. A lot of the time it's not. And you have to use kind of your, your best judgment to figure out what good environmental impact data what's the best available to, to really help make that decision. A lot of the time you, you, you can use, there's generic data sets, there's industry average um, data sets, or sometimes it's appropriate to use EPDs that are for similar products. So within this software, you know, the environmental impact data usually applies that cradle to gate emissions. And then the whole building LCA software also wor works through some assumptions um, that you can enter yourself to get that whole cradle to grave viewpoint from a carbon perspective. Here's an example of what some of the LCA results can look like. So what we have over here is, you know, on the y-axis, the total uh, cumulative metric tons of, of CO2e, which is the, the unit of embodied carbon. And so here are the various materials, the top 10 materials stacked, and then the remaining materials are all combined in this one, uh, in this one bar. As you can see, you know, around 90% of the embodied carbon uh, is within those 10 materials, uh, which shows that you can really make significant reductions by just targeting a few key elements here. Another interesting thing in energy optimization, there's the concept of energy use intensity or EUI, which is the energy use per floor area of the building. And here we, we have a similar embodied carbon intensity, uh, part in the mix of uh, metric and imperial units, but <laughs> it's kind of a mix here in the US. <laughs> So looking at this project, and this is, uh, this is just the, the baseline. So we did the initial assessment. We, we saw essentially the hotspots of carbon in the building. And now we can start developing scenarios. So let's say we selected, instead of that baseline steel, we selected a high recycled content steel and a lower cement content concrete that would result in about a 13% reduction from baseline. And this is just kind of an illustration. A lot of the time, the reduction potentials are much higher. But as you can see, just focusing on two results in a significant reduction. Next, we can target some of the other materials. In the, rema in the remaining materials, there was some wood, so you can look at some reclaimed wood using a lower carbon product for paint, higher recycle content, interior metal framing product. And that can result in an overall 21% reduction from baseline. So usually we'll develop a few scenarios for our clients, a few levers to pull. And, you know, as the project progresses, we can see, you know, which options are realistic, which may be harder to achieve. And so we can have kind of a menu um, of options to, to get them to their goals. Diving into uh, a few of the high impact materials that I mentioned, 
So looking at concrete, the main component of, of concrete that is responsible for most of the carbon emissions is the cement. And cement on its own is responsible for 8% of global carbon emissions. So that's, that's quite significant. And so the key to reducing concrete carbon emissions is to reduce cement content. And that's done by increasing what's known as SCM, or supplementary uh, cementing materials. And so essentially, there are options for replacing cement um, with, with these types of materials. So slag, which is a byproduct of steel manufacturing, fly ash, which is a byproduct of um, burning coal for energy. Uh, and there's some emerging SCMs like glass pozzolan, which is essentially recycled glass. And these percentages refer to the percent of cement that's being replaced by these products. So 20 to 40 SCM, so 20 to 40% cement reduction, is currently attainable for most applications. 70% can be used for footings and other non-exposed areas where the actual finish of the concrete isn't as critical. And the 90% SCM mixes are currently being developed. And these, these percentages generally correlate to the carbon reduction. So, you know, 90% carbon reduction mixes are, are currently being developed and possible. Another strategy is to use recycled aggregates. So, you know, the, the other component of the concrete is the aggregate. And you're able to reduce your embodied carbon emissions a bit by using recycled aggregates. And there's some interesting strategies coming out around using sequestered carbon uh, as aggregate. Um, they're still kind of in their pr prototype phases, but it'll be really interesting as that has huge potential. So now looking at steel, the general strategies here are to maximize the recycled content of steel. Um, you know, you reduce that virgin steel that needs to be uh, mined essentially. And you also need to maximize the renewable energy used in production. And so there's two main methods for manufacturing steel and the, the method that you select or that you're able to select really matters for embodied carbon. So the more traditional method is the basic oxygen furnace or BOF, and it's powered by coal or natural gas, and it takes about a 27% uh, recycled content on average. A newer, more emerging technology that's it's still quite widely available is the electric arc furnace or EAF. And this is completely powered by electricity and on average has about a 79% recycled content. And this can result in a 50% embodied carbon reduction over something like the BOF method. Another approach or another uh, kind of component of the whole building that you can look at that's not as widely covered is paint in this case. But really this is uh, illustrative of finishes in general. So although they uh, finishes have a relatively low embodied carbon impact initially, if they have, let's say, a 10-year life and the building life is 60 years, you really need to understand what that whole life impact is. So even though the initial impact is 107,000, the whole life impact is 645,000. So it can be quite high when comparing to something like steel that is not that replaced. Is not replaced. All right. All right. Now we'll look now at we'll some look more at... holistic embodied carbon reduction strategies. So mass timber, this refers to a class of engineered wood products. CLT is an example, which is cross laminated timber that you see here. Glue lam, which is glue laminated beams. These are structural wood members that can replace concrete and, and steel in traditional structures. And so mass timber, is a really good way to reduce the embodied carbon emissions of the manufacturing process because they're, you know, nature does the manufacturing of these products except for some of the final kind of fabrication. But also, um, it's really critical to source your lumber from sustainably managed forests, such as those that are FSC certified, because this can actually ensure carbon storage. So, the carbon that's captured within the wood structure itself throughout the tree's life can actually uh, be stored within the building. And that can amount to a significant carbon reduction when you're using a structural system like this. 
Another approach is to use more durable products. So, you know, carpet can last, you know, five years, they say 10, but, you know, um, whereas hardwood, you know, may just need to be refinished every now and then, but can last quite a long time. So really looking at those life cycle impacts. Reusing structure is, is really important. So structures that have already been created and that carbon has already been emitted, we want to make sure, you know, that wasn't for nothing. <laughs> we want to make sure that we extend their life for as long as possible. So here's an example of a project that reused the, the original structure and resulted in a 75% reduction in embodied carbon for that reason. There's also opportunities to reduce the structure when you are using new construction. So this is the 181 Fremont Tower in San Francisco. And, you know, as you can imagine, there's significant seismic requirements. And they used uh, this unique exoskeleton damper approach, which ended up reducing the steel required by 20%. So now we'll go into a few uh, few ways the whole industry can really help out in this process. And I'm adding on policymakers there because policies can really drive a lot of reductions uh, in these in this industry too. So architects, uh, it's important to integrate LCA throughout the design process and make design decisions based on embodied carbon. Kind of as I was mentioning through that example, looking at different scenarios, looking at the hotspots. Become familiar with bio-based products. These products are essentially manufactured by nature and they store carbon. Because you are working on developing you know, all the specs for the project, you're able to limit carbon through performance requirements within the specs. Next, um, stress the importance of reducing embodied carbon to your clients. You know, you're, you're on the forefront talking to your clients about what they want and a lot of the time they look to you to understand what's important in the industry right now. So stressing this to your clients can make a huge difference for the whole project. And then when you're interacting with product manufacturers, let them know that reducing embodied carbon is critical to you. For structural engineers, the first two are, are generally the same. You know, there's some really good tools that I'll cover later for integrating embodied carbon analysis into structural engineers workflow. For our structural specs, there's ways to limit carbon through performance requirements. And then when you're developing those specs, there are certain things you can do to ensure that embodied carbon reductions are not limited. And here they are. For general contractors, uh, you can require EPDs from bidders for some of those high impact materials like concrete and steel, and then actually use embodied carbon as a selection criteria for these materials. You know, if the client has uh, a good understanding of this, you know, you can pitch them on looking at cost as well as carbon. Also, um, encourage subs to use low carbon construction technology and equipment, such as electric, uh, electric buggies, electric uh, tractors. And then serve as a conduit between the design intent and construction reality. What I mean here is ensure that though the designers are talking to the actual installers of the procurers and installers of the product as you know there may be opportunities for re reducing carbon if everybody's kind of in the same room manufacturers can help uh you know saint gobain is really leading this as you all saw so it can obtain epds for products as they're doing invest in carbon-free energy sources uh, and a, a good example here is evraz in in the us just became the largest behind the meter, installed the largest behind the meter solar project in the country for manufacturing steel. As I mentioned, you know, uh, increasing recycled content is critical and if possible, increasing bio-based content. Policymakers are very critical to this. There isn't a direct connection to cost like there is with energy. So policy will really be critical in pushing this forward. So ensure local codes allow for mass timber structures. A lot of local structural codes don't allow for mass timber uh, at scale, but policymakers can, can work to allow for that. Incorporate low carbon performance requirements into building codes, add embodied carbon transparency, aka EPDs, uh, and carbon limits to procurement requirements. So similar to what I was saying for the general contractors, this can actually be applied on a municipal scale too. 
and encourage low carbon construction. There's a really interesting example of a, of a small town in Canada that their sustainability officer went to a conference, heard a, a presentation and decided to go back to their town and develop a grant for low carbon homes. So I wanted to cover really quickly some of the free tools that are available out there to start working on this now. So EC3, uh, the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator, is available. It has a really robust database of products, and you're able to do uh, some of these calculations that I mentioned. The Athena Impact Estimator is another good uh, whole building LCA tool. Carbon Smart Materials Palette that I mentioned, that's, that, that comes out of Architecture 2030, a really great tool for when you're selecting your materials and looking at other options. And then these two are for structural engineers. Uh, SEI Structural Engineering Institute put out this embodied carbon estimator for structural materials. And Beacon is a free tool developed by Thornton Tomasetti for uh, integrating embodied carbon calculations within the BIM uh, design process for structural engineers. So main takeaways, 90% of embodied carbon is emitted before the building even opens. And we feel like a 25% reduction um, can be had for no additional cost, but there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. And there's an opportunity to act now on all projects and there's free tools out there for you to really get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody who's in South Africa and uh, good morning if you're in other parts of the world. My name is Oliver. I am a facilitator in the Western Cape Industrial Symbiosis Program at Green Cape. And uh, Green Cape is a sector development agency in uh, the Western Cape of South Africa with the mandate to boost the circular economy or the green economy of South Africa. But today I'll be talking about the uptake of secondary raw materials from the manufacturing sector up into the construction sector. So a lot of the work that we do is at the coal face, we interact with people that are in business and you know, we understand that, that a lot of these changes could also have a financial implications. So we have to be very sensitive to that. Just in explaining what Green Cape is, I'm going to show you uh, this depiction of the circular economy from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So this pretty much um, uh, encompasses the ethos of what we are working towards, a economy where materials are valued, where they can be used over and over instead of being picked out into the environment or disposed of. And so really uh, increasing the productivity of materials and energy. Yeah, Green Cape works through the various sectors, energy, water, waste, uh, to try and uh, increase the, the circular economy in those areas. Uh, the Western Cape Industrial Symbiosis Program is hosted within Green Cape. It's a team that's fluctuated since the inception in 2013. So that's uh, a bit more than seven years now. And basically what happens is that the team facilitates these connections or, or relationships between businesses. And the purpose is to then identify and to share business opportunities. So things like the exchanging of unused or residual materials or resources rather, because resources includes materials, but also energy, water, uh, assets, logistics, expertise, capacity, etc. And as I mentioned, the, the ultimate goal is to drive up efficiency and reduce wastage. And uh, by implication, this should also be driving up profitability or reducing expenditure. Just quickly uh, to mention um, how it's been made possible. So we are funded uh, currently by the city of Cape Town. They have not been our funder for the entire project. We were also previously funded by the um, provincial government. And uh, since the inception, we've always been hosted by Green Cape, the sector development agency. And then we also have some national and some international partners as well, who we collaborate with to replicate a lot of what we do in other areas. But we find that generally industrial symbiosis uh, is very geographic dependent. So high density of industry kind of leads to a higher turnout. So some of the metrics for what we've achieved so far, we've built a network 
within South Africa of more than 900 companies. The majority of the companies in our network are local, but for some of the, the biggest ones, like your cement kilns or like uh, heavy manufacturing who, who might not be, you know, like steel manufacturing, might not be in the uh, urban centers, but they still form part of our network because in those cases, it's often viable to transport resources a greater distance. We're proud that a, a very large percentage of our network are small to medium enterprises. And then coming out of those upwards of 900 uh, members, we've we've identified uh, more than seven and a half thousand resources. And the resources are either materials that are looking for a home or for a need where a resource is needed. And so some of the metrics of the output has been that we've diverted more than 110,000 tons of waste from landfill in total. And this is, equates to value to our uh, member companies, or you know, so basically the network of more than 128 million brands. And just based on the amount of funding we've received, it's, it, the return on investment is more than 12 to 1. And then we've used a carbon calculator to to estimate the the carbon savings from these diversions, and it's uh, currently sitting on 344,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents that have been saved. Um, and then the the job creation part of this is a mixture of both observed job creation that's been recorded as well as a jobs calculator based on the observed. Because uh, you, you can't always observe the jobs that are created. So 360 jobs created throughout the economy, which seems little, but those are those are uh, the continuous jobs that have been made. So on to a little bit more about what I want to share with you today, which is that, you know, we have these material flows which are largely uh, linear, and we're trying to uh, increase the circularity of those flows. And so Obviously, we, we started with the low-hanging fruits, and as a result, uh, we found that the building industry was a source of large volumes of material, but also a potential sink for large volumes of materials. And so instead of calling these materials waste, we call them secondary raw materials, or we call them resources. And so, yeah, we've, we've kind of very proud that we've managed to stimulate demand for some of these previously unwanted materials. I think the lowest hanging fruit that that I can talk about is builders rubble. This is basically uh, the materials that arise from the demolition of either buildings or roads or any infrastructure. And with this, you often get a lot of quite quite um, consistent material and uh, large volumes. And it can be quite versatile depending on where it is and how you process it. So we've been very fortunate that in South Africa, there's been increasing demand through contracts that have required more and more recycled content. And so there's been a shift in the demand for recycled builders rubble. And we've worked with either building companies uh, or, or crushing contractors or even municipalities to create uh, six, we're currently standing on six uh, synergies. So that they require uh, at least two partners in a synergy and these six synergies have yielded the uptake of 18,000 tons of previously unassigned rubble. So these, these include sinks into uh, being added to the base of roads. In one instance, it was to create a new road uh, to stabilize a dirt road. And then otherwise, it's gone into building foundations, road foundations, or crushed into aggregates to go into cementitious applications. I think you know, when while Boris was speaking, a lot of these things resonated to me that I didn't even realize. So he was talking about SEM, uh, which is basically using other aggregates to displace cement. And this is something that's happened without us being aware of the concept of SEM, perhaps. So in in our region, uh, there are a number of coal boilers that produce produce ash. And a lot of this was actually destined for landfill. So, so in some cases there were alternative applications, but largely we intervened to assist a lot of this ash waste to find uses. And so, so we looked at um, brick making, specifically cement or clay brick manufacturers. And so we find that you know, one of the main drivers here is, is not only the cost of, of landfill, which is going up rapidly, uh, thankfully actually, and uh, 
it's also the increasing price of raw materials. So we're, we're sort of headed towards a shortage of silica sand, for example. And so plugging in these, these wastes or secondary raw materials can actually make these products cheaper. Um, and so it was relatively easy job to convince brick makers to include ash into their into the cement bricks. And so we've had about eight synergies where the increase in demand for ash waste has gone up by uh, 10,000 tons annually. So that's, that's number two. Um, the Western Cape, for those of you that aren't aware, recently went through a very hectic drought and the city was making all kinds of desperate efforts to reduce the demand for potable water. And uh, the construction sector was one of the most obvious places to look. So they used to just use potable water in, in, on site to make bricks or to make cement, et cetera. And so we managed to facilitate between the construction companies, uh, the raw material providers, but also then the water treatment plants or um, groundwater extraction and we've managed to facilitate quite a bit of diversion from, from potable water to treated effluent. Another interesting thing was that uh, there's a kind of water that's called basement water, which is essentially sump drainage from, from basements that tend to fill up with groundwater. And this water is obviously not uh, good enough for, for consumption, but it is good enough for cement. And although the drought has ended, I think a lot of these practices continue. And then, of course, homage to the, to the sponsor of this event, uh, the St. Cobain facility in the Western Cape has been working for years to try and find a solution for the manufacturing waste of their gypsum um, ceiling board and corners products. And we worked with them for a number of these years to try and find facilities that could take it as is, so like farmers and composters, etc. cetera. Um, but it turned out that there needed to be a processing facility set in place. And so uh, some of our team assisted in facilitating the process of establishing a new gypsum recovery plant uh, in Cape Town. And that is currently processing 1,800 tons annually of gypsum products. So the gypsum you know, is, is repurposed. And then I think the paper has to be um, put either into composting or into, um, into farming. And then um, another really interesting sector is the textile sector. Now, you might not um, see how this is relevant for the construction sector, but a lot of textiles were either uh, destined for landfill or in South Africa, we actually have a very strong culture of hand-me-downs. So T-shirts will have many, many lives before they are finally turned into a rag. But all things do come to an end. And so we worked with various textile industry players, um, Obviously, it was mostly the manufacturers, and we we facilitated the uptake of a lot of this material to a carpeting and underfelt manufacturer, who then diverted 730 tons per year uh, of textile waste for underfelt for carpeting. Um, so that's a nice second life for that stuff. Um, wood is one of the most interesting secondary raw materials because it is so diverse. Um, so there are a, variety of sources of this material coming from uh, either packaging or production and it comes in various shapes and sizes and formats as well so you get large format you get really broken down small format you get um, your different kinds of treated boards like your fiber boards your chip boards and your shutter boards and your marine ply etc the list goes on and the variety of chemicals and adhesives that are used to make this. So this is something that we are working on a continuous basis, but so far we've had at least 50 different synergies that increase the, the uptake of this material. And so that's led to the diversion of 1,280 tons of raw material. It's just occurred to me that uh, Marlis mentioned to, for the CPD points earners that you need to know what synergy is. Synergy is actually the program that we use. It's like a database for all of the materials and organizations. And so Synergy is the tool that we use to create synergies. Yeah, so just bear that in mind. That's your CBD point handed to you. Right. Um, yeah, another SEM really interestingly uh, is, is glass, as, as Boris mentioned. So yeah, we've, we've had uh, quite a lot of uh, glass issues in, in our province. So 
this kind of glass called float glass or, or architectural glass does not get manufactured or recycled in our province. It gets manufactured in Gauteng. And so for it to be reprocessed back into float glass, it would have to be transported there. Um, but most of the time it doesn't happen. And so a lot of this material was destined for landfill. We found one a new business called Simple Active Tactics that, that we're, we're very proud to have become associated with, then based their new production facility, their crushing plant on the materials that we could source for them. So we sourced about 50 tons a month of their currently 70 tons a month requirement. And this came from companies that bring down big sheets of the glass, they cut it to size for their clients, and then they have a whole lot of, of the offcuts. Um, and then this goes through the processing um, plant, and then it gets separated into the different grades for either water filtration media, for abrasives, you know, like blast and grit. It could also be used uh, as a filler in, you see on the right there is a cement tile, but it, it goes into a variety of cement applications. And then some of the more interesting ones are that the really fine grades can go into paint. So that's another another saving there on raw materials. And it can also be a filler in, in things like epoxies and plastics. It can displace, um, in plastics, they often use minerals like uh, like lime, for example, as a as a filler just to bulk up the plastic. So this can be used in those cases. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting one. And um, polystyrene are really difficult to manage. Plastic previously largely not recycled, still only recycled uh, to a low level. But we've assisted in the uptake of more than seventy seven tons of polystyrene. Now you can imagine if it's ninety five percent air. 77 tons of polystyrene is quite a lot of bulk and this either gets recycled into picture frames cornices or ceilings and then a lot of it can also go into lightweight cement bricks so it's really it's quite a it's quite a budding market but it's really booming and so yeah ceilings and cornices etc sorry saint Cobain, but yeah um, polystyrene recycled polystyrene can also go into those materials and yeah bricks lightweight bricks soundproof bricks can also be made with with polystyrene so we've assisted companies to source that material and then there was another company that wanted to use post-consumer polystyrene so that's polystyrene that's contaminated and they needed a, a large cash injection to buy the wash plant machinery to increase their their uptake of post-consumer so we assisted them to get some government funding for that and then something that's not our project that i thought would be quite interesting for you is that Second-hand building materials. So in the demolition of buildings, you, you get things like your windows and your door frames, roof tiles and, you know, wooden ceiling boards or, or floorboards. There's such a variety of items that come out of that. And in many cases, they are damaged. But, you know, largely the process for that was that the demolition company would have a salvage yard. They would use what they could, but then they would basically send a lot of it to landfill. And then my program, the WISP program, managed to divert quite a lot of the stuff to secondhand uh, building material salvage yards that would then sell to the informal building sector of South Africa. But there were still quite a lot of losses with this. And um, through a government program called the Better Living Challenge, this, this opportunity came to the attention of a consulting firm called Arup, and they are in the process of setting up a new app. And the app essentially is a trading port for building materials. So, you know, these demolition companies with these with these salvage yards that don't know where to send them can load them up. And then these informal building contractors can find it there, find what they need and all the specs and source that material. So, yeah, this is work that we are not in control of. This is something, as I mentioned, that's being handled by, uh, by Arab, but it's it's really... It's a wonderful development, especially for South Africa, where we have so much informal building going on. And then just looking looking forward to the future. So we're working to unlock and divert other materials, which we've still not found solutions for. So we, there are a lot of hurdles to be faced in this, like um, not only cost, but also legislative, or also just uh, unwillingness from industry to change or risk aversion, which, which is all very understandable. And so some of these include foundry sand. So foundry sand, 
is actually quite a prolific waste stream. So in the Western Cape, we're sending uh, well above 73,000 tons a year to landfill. But a lot of this, so we are trying to assist um, a company that's trying to establish to build uh, autoclaved uh, air aerated cement brick. Um, and so they're trying to establish a factory right next door. But this really requires a lot of legal applications, a lot of facilitation and um, a lot of business synergy building. And uh, it's been a really long journey, but we're expecting that this is going to be successful and that you will be able to buy um, aerated bricks made with used foundry sand in the next couple of years in the Western Cape. And, and there are a number of other uh, ordinary cement brick manufacturers who've also showed interest uh, in this material. I think it will take a lot of, of extra capacity building to, to absorb the 73,000 tons a year. But it's just crazy that we are mining so much silica sand, which is now running out, and we're throwing away 73,000 tons a year of silica sand, which is contaminated with, with foundry chemicals. And so well, this has been achieved elsewhere in the world, but we're, we're working to do the same here. And then just the final few, um, so plastics, there's a lot of plastics that are still bound for landfill. Uh, we, we're also running the South African Plastics Pact, which is trying to build a circular economy for plastic packaging. And so please look into that if you're interested. But there are a lot of construction sector applications for, for recycled plastics, even the lowest of grades. So examples include roof tiles, which there have been projects in South Africa, making planks. There are ongoing projects in the Western Cape and in Gauteng to, to make planks. Uh, either for pallets or for, for benches or walkways. And, and then there are other relatively new developments, such as making bricks or, or roads. We have our first pilot um, uh, recycled plastic road in South Africa. So we're working, you know, this requires a lot of collaboration between the various uh, sectors like academics and then, you know, the, the various um, suppliers and processes. Another really interesting material category is composite material. So we have a budding boat building and pool making uh, sector in the Western Cape. And there are a significant amount of offcuts and, and waste coming from that, which have currently don't have a use. Um, I mentioned earlier chemically treated woods. Uh, so those are the ones that really struggle to find, find a use. And so we're working with legislators, but also with technology developers to try and find new solutions for this. Um, and I mentioned also secondhand building materials. So that that project with Arab, but uh, an ongoing effort from us to link the secondhand building material stockists, like the, the just the little yards with the demolition projects. So yeah, that's our that's our work. That's that's how far we are. Seven years in and going strong. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, and a very good afternoon from this side on rather the northern side of the globe. So from cold Finland as well. So my name is Aditi and I am the business developer at Bionova or One Click LCA as it's commonly known. And um, yeah, we are basically a company that started almost 20 years back and we have been in the construction sector working since then. I will get into a bit more about the company, but that will be a bit later on. So I'll just basically dive right into it where Boris left off. So I think he already explained before, and he did mention the amount of embodied carbon that is going to be there because cities are going to grow by about 2 trillion meters square. And this amount of embodied carbon is like if you see on the right, you have almost 100 gigatons of embodied carbon coming only from new construction. So this is not even considering renovation or even demolition for that matter. And this is very, very critical. And so it is also important to take a life cycle perspective where we actually, you know, measure, learn and then act. And that is to be prioritized right now as well. So Maybe this is something you have seen before, or if not, you can also find it in the link down below. So if you see, this is the embodied carbon pyramid to help you in prioritizing your actions. And it is based on time. So with the earlier action, the more impact it can have. 
So basically, if we look at this part, you have the bottom-up approach. So you're first redefining the solution and you're trying to understand if there's actually a need for it. Then what you're looking to do is you want to make the most out of the existing assets that you have. Then you're looking at the reducing your material consumption. And then you're looking at reusing existing buildings or existing materials. And when you really need to buy materials, you need to introduce requirements for low carbon products. The embodied carbon policy, as Boris also mentioned before, is targeting towards policymakers. So you get to see this also in there. But just to highlight then is that this was developed by Bionova and by the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance in collaboration with Architecture 2030. So you can find a more detailed understanding of this. But the most essential part is that we need to start making and we need to start understanding how to prioritize our actions. Because as you can see from this graph over here, the ability to influence the life cycle emissions is the highest in the very early stages of your design compared to later on where it goes all the way down. So decisions made earlier on have a very lasting impact for the years to come. And you have, as you see over here, you have different stages in your design that you need to look at. And at this point of time, you may also have different people involved in all of those different stages. So the most important aspect is that you have to work together so that you look at these life cycle emissions very early on at the stage of planning rather than later on. So how does one click LCA then help you? And how can you deliver all of these services? So what we understood, and like I said before, is because there are different people involved in the different stages of constructing a building, we have or we offer tools for every stage of the project. As most of you already know, traditionally LCA uh, was being done in the later stages, maybe at as, as build stage. Uh, however, now it, there has been a change and there has been more of an emphasis on doing it early on so that you can understand the impact of embodied carbon and you can also set decarbonization targets as well. So looking at this slide over here, in the early stages, you have the strategy phase. So a tool that is unique is something called a site designer, which is not designing a building, but it's looking at choosing a site where you can compare different locations. So as an example, this might be used by public sector or a retail chain, for example, who is looking at where to build a store. And then comes the concept design stage. So this involves architects or designers. And the tool in this particular stage is the carbon designer. This allows you to basically model a building in a simplified manner without having designed it already. So what you need to do is you're defining the building type, the area, the number of floors it is, and you're able to generate all the material quantities and, me and measure carbon by looking at this shoebox design. You can then, of course, optimize it further to get it as close as possible to your design. And so next, when you look at it, you can easily compare different material types. This is at least like in the Nordics is being used by a majority of our customers and it is becoming more and more relevant also everywhere around the world. And then for the later phases, you can use your Revit, like BIM tools or BEM tools, and you can import bill of materials for your detailed life cycle assessment. And at the same time, conduct a life cycle costing, or also you can do circularity analysis as well. So it's important to look at and start early on and use these different tools along the entire process as well. So I would, uh, definitely recommend like just starting with this quite early on so that you're able to make impactful decisions. Then looking at how you can actually use one click LCA. So it's quite easy in terms of finding materials 
and quite easy and intuitive also in terms of just clarifying your material quantities. So you're able to look for different materials quite easily by just typing in the names or if you know the manufacturer, if you're going to be using EPDs, you can just type in the manufacturer as you can see from the example over here. In one click LCA, the database that is there, you have both generic data that is used as well as EPD specific data that is incorporated from almost about more than 25 plus different platforms from around the world. So we make sure and we do this every single week so that um, you have the latest data that you can use into your projects and do your calculations for LCA or just even carbon footprint. Another feature that there is, is you can actually do material comparisons. So you can access material carbon benchmarks with data from manufacturers around the world because you do have that possibility, like I said, because of the data that is integrated, you're able to use them, you're able to set targets, you're able to look at the different benchmarks, and you're also able to compare those different materials, of course, as you can see from the example over here. So you're comparing one against all those that are available. So one that could be available in the country itself, then in the surrounding areas, and then you have the ones that are available globally. So you can make use of the tool and the feature in order to set your carbon targets or even just to compare simply at the early stages of your design, what materials can be used in your project as well. And then of course, you have quite a lot of analytical graphs and visualizations that will help you in getting a better, a, a better picture of what the total impact is for your project and so on. So you have quite a significant number of them that you can also download and reuse in your projects and that you can also send to your clients as well. One thing I think Boris mentioned before is that it is important that everyone works together in this area to globally decarbonize construction. And that is also one of the things that we are looking to do. So we are working essentially with almost all the different stakeholders that are involved in the construction chain, right from manufacturers who can use the software to do a product LCA on their products or to go one step further and do environmental product declarations, EPDs, and then on the building side of things for engineers and architects, consultants and structural engineers, for example, they can use the software to simply do a carbon assessment of their products or they can also, if they are going for any kind of certifications as well, they can also use the same tool in order to do that. And I think the reason why we are working with the entire construction industry is because we also want to you know, cover the entire value chain and make it easier for all of these different stakeholders to share data, to request for data, and to easily get an LCA done or to easily get a just a carbon assessment done for their products. So you're able to use, so the software would be something that would be quite, quite easy to use. Then you have the one-click LCA platform, which like I said before, you have a global database taking into account both generic data as well as EPD specific data that you can use for doing your calculations. It's also basically for some of the regions around the world. Of course, there's a limitation on data, but in that case, you can use generic data to you know, use your uh, to, uh, data points for your assessments, if at all you are not able to use EPD-specific data as well. And then, of course, it has a global compliance, so you can go for different certifications as well. And then it can integrate also to 10 plus design tools so it could be Revit, uh, if that is something that you use and is quite commonly used as well. Or then, for example, Design Builder could be one, uh, or even you can simply use an Excel sheet. And using one tool, you're able to also get like different set of tools along with it. So you can choose what it is and where it is that you want to go ahead. So I think one small case study that I would really like to show is basically a 
like we won your back, we decided to shift our base. Basically, we had to uh, move just a few meters down the road. But what we also decided to do was basically to use the net zero carbon like commitment and follow the LBC principle. It means that you're reducing negative environmental impacts. What you're ideally looking to do is that you're ideally, your project should be having more of the positive impacts that you're going for. So from an LCA point of view, you are of course taking into account materials, transport, replacement, wastage, and so on. And so we at BioNova also have committed to uh, the World uh, Green Building Council's uh, net zero goals as an organization. And taking that philosophy of net zero, we decided to also have a BioNova office renovation as well. So the office that we actually uh, moved into was in a very old building. And of course, as you know, it's quite energy in intensive as well. And another thing was that it was literally just located almost a kilometer from the old office, but it was also close by to a coal fire district heating plant, which is of course closing down at the end of this decade. But since it's an old building, of course it's energy intensive. Offices often undergo like renovation with every new tenant. And since this next, like this project of ours was our very own office, we also wanted to be sure that we are, you know, investing and we are going by the net zero goals that are there. So what we also, you know, looked at and we also wanted to avoid unnecessary replacements of finishes and particulars and set the net zero carbon objective for the project. So we looked at how to go about doing this and we modeled three different designs in the one-click LCA software. So the first one that you see is a standard retrofit office and initial light retrofit plan, as you can see in the center. And then on the right, you have the actual circular retrofit. And we looked at the global warming potential or the embodied carbon, the material efficiency and the building circularity. On the top left column graph, the standard retrofit is the baseline of, of 100, has a baseline of 100 uh, with approximately 33,000 kg of CO2. And our initial plan came in at about 35% of that, so almost about 11,000 kgs of CO2. And if you look further below, our actual design was even lower because of all the different adjustments that we made at just 16% or a little over 5,000 kg of CO2. The material efficiency naturally followed a similar trend of going from a mass of materials of almost 22,000 so as you can see on the right graph over here, um, and down to about 6,000 kgs. So we had a reasonably good starting point in terms of circularity. With the standard retrofit, due to the high percentage of materials re returns recycling, but our initial plan didn't quite meet what we wanted to do. So we further decided to reduce our own use of virgin material and increase the amount of recycled, recovered materials, as well as materials returns, recycling to reach up to about 45%, as you can see over here. It's worth noting though, that the actual circularity is, or may likely be higher due to the reuse of recovered materials from within the office, which were not considered as of this point in these models. So, if you can, like, this is actually after it has been redone. And if you can see over here, a couple of photos from the renovated office. It's quite common in Finland to, you know, take off your shoes at the office. And that there's always this temptation that you need to have a carpeted flooring for that. But we did resist doing that. And by doing so, we preserved over 90% of the existing floors and the existing walls. But although we fell short of using 90% reused or salvaged materials, we weren't far off and gave back any oversupply of materials for selling on further. 
And in the bot on the in the bo in the bottom right picture, you can see some tiling as well. And here, the flooring was damaged, and the boards were actually cracked. So instead of pulling it all up, we simply just replaced those damaged boards with tiles. One other thing we did was to find a solution to upgrade the ventilation instead of replacing it altogether, which made a significant impact in helping us to achieve that net zero target. So just having a small scale example of how we actually used our own office as an example to try to be or try to go towards the net zero. Yeah. And then looking at taking into account, you know, using the software, taking into account the embodied carbon, the material efficiency and the circularity to build more sustainably. So that's also something that, um, yeah, just a small example from our very own office as a short case study. And lastly, maybe to end off, I also wanted to highlight a free tool that we also have. And the purpose of the free tool was to help decarbonize the materials design. So it looks at focusing on carbon intensive materials and you're able to compare and optimize design options. You're able to look at what are the different low carbon products that are available. We currently have this in about nine languages today and it is supported by about 25 global partners. And the reason to come up with this was to basically help in pushing the concept of embodied carbon further on so that this is taken up on a larger scale and so that this also helps to push manufacturers to transparently communicate about their products since it is really essential to use environmental product declarations to do a life cycle assessment or in embodied carbon projects, projects themselves. And that was the main idea of it so that we can help get this uptake and that architects and designers can actually start using this in the early phases of the design rather than later on where you don't have that much influence to change materials because they might not be available or because it would be costly in that way. So that has been the push towards making uh, or having this free tool available. And this is available globally, so you can simply just go on the website and look at the planetary tool, or you can also follow the direct link um, down below in uh, on the slide. I would really like to thank you again for attending. And if you have any questions, just feel free to contact. Just want to draw your attention to our future events, our upcoming events. In March, we have one planned uh, on regenerative design, and we're going to discuss a case study. And in April, we're thinking of uh, talking around the core certification of the Living Building Challenge. And in May, we are thinking of doing a session on Living Future in Africa and hoping to hear from other participants of collaboratives all over in Africa. And also just a reminder that if you want to have an introduction to the Living Building Challenge presentation, that is obviously always available on request. Just contact me or Tulani to assist you with that. And then just very briefly want to mention the Living Future Conference is coming up in April. I can definitely recommend attending that. It's online so everybody can is able to enter the conference. And then just where to find us, you can contact us on our Gmail address and we have a presence on LinkedIn and Facebook. So please interact with us there. And then just lastly, a very a big thank you to our sponsor, St. Gobain. I think all the speakers mentioned St. Gobain or it was in the presentation slide. So I think it was a really good fit for this webinar. And thank you to the three speakers. I think the presentations were amazing, very informative. And I think we learned a lot and I think we have a lot to discuss in, in South Africa and, and going forward. So with that, I really like to thank you for attending and thank you for the great questions on the, on the chat and the interactions. And I hope to see you in the next webinar in March. Thank you very much, very much.